I'm going to do my teleprompter back up so I can see what I was going to say. Yes. You have like a sheet of like the things that you should. Yeah, actually, I already gave, I already gave them to you. Okay, but like which ones? Like, you know, it'll be You know, it's like 10 minutes. It will not be. Like if, if you can identify, but what is Chad? Let me see. I'll tell you what on the quiz. I don't think I do have with the video on it. I got a I got a No, not, that's always a problem. And everyone was here yesterday. I gave you time to read. That's why. And Cauldron. Okay, so with that. Yeah. Well, it's been from popular demand. There's been uh, people have been saying, but where do we put our bribes? In the cauldron. Because I will take bribes. You can bribe me. They just won't help your grade or anything at all because I'm effectively honest. But I will take them because I want you to feel good about yourself as people. Who's with me on that? And so, therefore, with the cauldron, you just randomly put your valuable, meaning Kit Kat, in you. And then you see, who thinks that's a good idea? See, democracy in action. 444,000 people just voted for that. <laughs> I had to show off my calls in the Mr. Mahela show. Okay, so with that, and he was really impressed. All right, did we get to this? Okay, let's go. We're gonna we have to go pretty fast through this. I'm gonna go fast. Well, Hamiltonian economics led directly to elections and then the Vietnam War. Okay, so with that down. Who wants a highlighter? I have no idea who they just somebody asked me here. Are you just sitting on the floor? It's not like all right, so Hamilton's going to write the report on manufacturers and report on uh, credit. And we're coming up to the two parties. What party is going to evolve around Hamilton's point of view? The Federalists. What party is going to evolve around Madison Jefferson? You've seen them called the Democratic Republicans in the textbook and various things, but they always called themselves Republicans. But if you see Democratic Republicans, that refers to Jefferson's party. Remember the anti-federalists and the federalists, they're the arguments about the Constitution. Hamilton and Madison were federalists for the Constitution, and then they would divide out. So with that, he saw government policy should help the financial elite. Give money to, I, it's got a little blank. Spend a picture, forgot about it. The wealthy. But money in the wealthy hand. In fact, his idea was this. Financial elite, those who had money, a.k.a. the creditors. The vast majority of people did not have money. And this did not include men like Hamilton. I'm sorry, this, this did not include men like Jefferson and Madison. They were plantation owners. They were wealthy, but they didn't have money ready to spend. Do they have money and they had their wealth in land and human beings? Slaves. So this didn't include them. So he wanted to help them. But the idea is if you give the rich more money, they will take this money because they're the smartest. They're the ones who are most capable. Therefore, why should a bunch of yahoos like, let me give you an example, us have money because we would just waste it and blow it on terrible and dumb things. They will take it and spend it on manufacturing and finance. Yes. Uh, so you have elements that are, the, the term for that would be, if you believe in this, you're more conservative. Maybe it's where you're more liberal. 
Uh, and so you were and like like most people, like almost all of us, we had all of us both. So it's like, oh yeah, there's some really dumb people out there. Wait a sec, there's some really greedy people. Yeah. So, and then banking. There were no banks. There were creditors, but there were no banks. I, I was just reading this thing about uh, the wars, the 1794, the great Northwest wars here. I don't know what all five, the Northwest. And it's talking about them waiting months for their, their writ of credit from the bank of Amsterdam, because there's no banks in the United States. And so then you need a standing military, not just to defend the borders, not just to get more land and take it from American Indians by force and force them off the land, not just to defend your borders, but to defend trade and to stop rebellion. Remember, Shades is rebellion to stop that. Next, low wages. What he wanted is a, for the vast majority of the people to be destitute, and therefore they will be desperate and take low wages and do jobs they would never do if they owned their own land and were independent farmers. He wanted to strip that from them and have these destitute workers to work in these new things called factories that are literally at this moment being created in Britain. So take independent farmers and make them low wage workers. That's the vast majority, while funding, funneling money to the very wealthy, keeping them poor. That gives you an idea of what he thought. Now I should add, this is the beginning, this is still pre-capitalism, pre-capitalism. But this is what we're going to call it by the 1890s, Hamiltonian economics will become laws of fair economics and eventually evolve into what we call today conservative economics. Now, by the 1890s, when that term started to be used for this, capitalism had been created the Industrial Revolution. In fact, we're in the second Industrial Revolution, with electricity and oil and that kind of thing. So it's a totally, completely different world. This is the precursor. Funnel money to the top. And economically, if they misuse it, they don't know what they're talking about. They say they're liberal or conservative. Unfortunately, there's some you know, political and economic illiteracy. It doesn't mean people aren't smart, they just don't understand. But we have very, or economically, the United States is conservative. The whole system is designed to funnel money to the top. To take money from, you know, keep wages low and funnel money to the top. The whole system. And every president we've had in your lifetime economically has been conservative, regardless of the party. Uh, almost all the presidents in my lifetime, the only president that you could say was not conservative uh, when it came to economics in my lifetime, or the last one in my lifetime would be Lyndon Johnson, who was out of office in 1969. Yes, I'm perfect. Huh? How about 40s? I'll do my forties. Maybe late thirties. I think he left office. Clean living. That's what keeps keeps you young. That and twenty to thirty pounds of vitamin C. <laughs> that's, just, that's all I eat. Vitamin C. Happens. Back to this. So, so for example, President Trump was one of the most conservative presidents in American history, and his only real success economically. It's hard to pass laws, so don't you know? It's really hard. With were massive tax cuts for very wealthy and large corporations. That was the only huge tax cuts for the very rich. And in essence, in three years, taxes are going to go for most working people. There's a little hitch in that bill, a slight increase, and it's going to go away and taxes will go up. Montana, what's Montana? You're going to have it, we're having a vast conservative experience. Huge tax cuts for the very wealthy and businesses. Um, most people, including in the next two years, the tax are going to go up for the very wealthy, especially out of state people, hoping they'll come in, buy a property and land, through investment. That's the grand conservative experiment. That's what that's what Governor Gene Ford is. Out of staters coming in and buying up land, hoping they encourage investment. Or to have the mansions and have yellow sun. Yeah. Any, any kind of way to make conservative liberals? Uh, I, I, you know, conservative and liberal, there are two different points of views. We might have different. Uh, I know, but I've come up with a way. To What's your way? 
uh, it's the script system of all of their money and make it so that having the opinion that they have a conservative actually affects them maybe it is when they're those middle children. Well, they would argue that um, they would argue that that policy is best for everybody, but. Uh, yeah, the tax quote, the tax highest tax rate used to be 91%. So we used to have that from the 60s, 70s, when I was a little kid in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You can pick which decade I was a little kid in. So with that, the assumption, let's do this. I'm gonna do this very quickly. I know we did it in our notes. I'm gonna do this really quick. So it's just such an amazing thing. So the assumption bill was gonna assume all the debts, the bonds, and this is from colonial, for the new states, continental Congress, Confederation Congress, all this debt. And remember I told you about before Shay's Rebellion. Speculators were, were scooping up, oh, I almost, and paying back at 100% of the value. Speculators were scooping up the bonds of soldiers and people on the frontier who were paid in bonds. They were paying one penny on the dollar. And then Hamilton's plan was to pay off those speculators, which by definition, that's the merchant class. To speculate, you need enough cash to invest in something you hope the value will go up and still have enough to survive. If you don't have money, speculation is a shockingly dangerous game. I know people who have done that. I mean, they borrow money to buy land. But yeah, it might go up, but it also might tank. But a penny on the dollar and then pay them at 100 percent of the value of the bond, that's a 1,000% profit. Imagine an investment making 1,000%. Wow, is it mean? Wow. So he wants to funnel money to that merchant class. I mean, there's, there's no hiding it. That's what they're doing. And there's Hamilton presenting this. Therefore, funnel money to the wealthy financiers. Now, Jefferson and Madison are wealthy, but they're not the bondholders. They're let, we're talking the merchant class. And there's not all that many. He wants to create more. Why? So funnel money to the upper class. Why? Well, there's a number of big reasons. The first one's the most obvious. Good credit. Some, but good credit. You pay off your debts, you get good credit. So that people will say, hey, they pay back their debts. I'll buy more bonds. I'll loan them more money. You're going to be very close to the age where you're going to start wanting to borrow money. So good credit really means a big deal. You pay lower interest rates. Buy a house and get, let's say, a 30-year mortgage. 30 years of lower interest rates, that's tens of thousands of dollars. Actually, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's a lot of money, are you? Not for all of us in here, but out there it is. I call it kind of yes. I can, but won't. And so the thing is, yeah. So a way to funnel money to the wealthy. Why do you want good credit? Well, there's only one reason to get good credit. Is it good? Excuse me, I'm going to read the water. Is it good? Yeah, it's good. That's great. Right. In the last chapter? No. You're never going to know what happened. All right. So with that, why get good credit? Why? He wants to borrow more money. He wants the United States government to watch a book. I shouldn't be in charge of that. He wants the federal government to borrow more and more and more money. He wants more debt. He wants the federal government to, to sell as many bonds as possible. But you have good credit, you don't have to pay as much interest. So yes, this is overhanging the government, but then you need a couple different things. You need taxes, you need a government structure to pay off this. But more importantly, they will take this bonds, the US government, borrow money, US government money and build Invest in manufacturing directly and indirectly. Also build roads. And I just put down roads, but you know, roads, canals, harbors. This is going to be called public works. Today, you've probably all heard the term infrastructure. That's a relatively new term, but that's what it means. 
and also the military. I don't know why I put and and and. I was into making it a little. Okay, so. But here is the most incredible part, I think. The second most incredible. He's going to take his money, do it to the merchants. Now, the merchants, they want their money back. They buy bonds, and they know down the road, 10, 20, 30 years, the federal government will pay it back. But the federal government won't pay them back if the federal government is gone and the U.S. falls apart. And so what he's doing is this. To this merchant class, who he gave them this money with this, the assumption bill, and then got them to loan the money back to the United States government, he has to this merchant class who will want their money back, I can't emphasize that enough, he will buy their loyalty. He will bind them to the United States government. The merchant class will do whatever it takes, therefore, to protect the United States government so they get their money back and he'll buy their loyalty. He's also implying by doing this that the merchant class really aren't loyal to the country. They're loyal to what? Money. So he's kind of saying, you know, they're scumbags, but we need them. By their loyalty, it's clever, isn't it? I mean, we all have a vested interest in the survival of the United States. Even if the United States does things we like or dislike, not just for bond, for all kinds of reasons, yes. Right at this moment. Here, wait a sec, so I finish this and I'll let you go. Okay, can we just wait one sec? All right, so with that, Therefore, they'll take this money and they too will invest in manufacturing. So the government will invest and the people will invest when they get more money. They'll encourage them. And they'll also encourage them to invest in manufacturing so the United States is stronger and survives. And they will become the first. The term hadn't been, been invented, but they will become a capitalist. A capitalist is the person who owns the machines. No, we have Proto-capitalist, it's coming, but we're not to capitalism yet. He's looking at Britain and it's starting right there. And he's very envious, Hamilton. Kind of an amazing plan, isn't it? Now we could argue good or bad. At this moment, it really depends where you're at. So how will you pay for a whiskey tax? A whiskey tax is an excise tax, so they're basically a value-added tax, and it's geared to tax the small producers of whiskey. Now, why is whiskey such a big deal? Think about corn. If you're going to sell corn, do so you get your cauldron of corn, a bushel of corn, you need to have a lot of bushels of corn to make money. Now, if you're right next to the market, it's not a big deal, but think about your western Pennsylvania, and you got to go over, basically, there's no roads except for maybe wagon ruts and try to get many bushels of corn. It's gonna be really expensive and time consuming. Corn, you, know, you gotta sell a lot. It's a problem farmers always have, shipping their goods, because they gotta sell a lot. But you can take this corn, turn it into a mash, high in sugar content, distill it, whiskey. Whiskey, you don't need to ship as much, you've increased the value of it, and therefore more profit. So that became a way for small farmers to make money. Take a mash, sugar, make this. Now, rum was a big drink, but rum, different kind of sugar, whiskey, a lot of corn, you know, corn syrup, right? Like sure. And then you don't need to ship as much. And since there's always shortage of money, whiskey is almost like money. They would actually be like value currency based upon how much whiskey they sold. It's a weird thing. But that's where whiskey, and therefore, the whole economy in the West based upon whiskey. I should add, and I know I've mentioned this once before, and I'll say it again you know, a couple more times just to emphasize this. People drank over 10 times or even more alcohol per day than when people drink today. At least at least. Just drank a lot more alcohol. It's kind of an all-day thing. But don't forget, there was no wage work as we know it. Nobody knew or cared what time it was. We didn't matter what time you got up. It was a different world. Good and bad. So, small the tax producers, they will bankrupt them. And for some reason, I wrote monopolies twice. But they'll create monopolies. He wants to get rid of the small farmers and have big farmers taken. 
who wants to destroy the small farmers, have this tax crush them. As it turned out, the tax wasn't quite big enough to do that, but it hit. And farmers are already so susceptible to this. Part of the reason why there are basically no small farmers left anymore. There are a few, but very few. You're all monopolies for food. And therefore, what will death street farmers? What choice will they have but to go to the cities and become the chief labor? That's why I put a question mark. What choice will they have? They're broke. They're desperate. They'll go to the cities, live in crowded hovels because there's no housing, and take whatever job they could get. And if you take a bunch of poor people off the farm to throw them in the cities, what's that going to do to wages? Drop them. And that's the plan. Crush them. Squeeze those small farmers, the vast majority of the population, and make them into desperate workers who take whatever wage they could get. This should remind you a little bit of indentured servitude. Even though technically they'll be free with a wage, but they'll have nothing. And that's the plan. That's the most amazing part. It's diabolical, isn't it? Thus be the cheap workers for the factories and cheap labor means more profit for the very wealthy. Doesn't it complete the circle? And even though it's not quite as, uh, they, they're not, people aren't gonna be quite as open as Hamilton was, this is the essence of conservative economics to this day. Uh, we'll call trickle-down economics in the 1920s, supply set economics in the 1980s, and uh, it's low wages, funnel money to the top. So with that, Jefferson and Madison were furious. And Jefferson had this vision of small independent farmers, and Hamilton's there saying, no, wage workers. All the rural farmers, their money will go to urban merchants. And that includes Jefferson, even though Jefferson's a plantation owner, once you allow for a whiskey excise tax, where's the excise tax on tobacco, for example? And so the money will suck from the working people to the top. And Jefferson was terrified of a bunch of wage slaves because wage slaves, how could they ever be citizens in a republic? And then he called, all Hamilton does is he, want, he called them his mercenaries to help his mercenaries, those rich merchants who he's got to buy their loyalty. Remember, a mercenary is a soldier who works for only one thing. What? Money, whoever pays them both, both, most, no loyalty. Yeah, Hamilton wanted to help the very same people he thought had no loyalty. Hamilton was very cynical and cruel. And what they want to create? Jefferson said, not a republic, but a plutocracy. Oligarchy is a rule by a few, so a few wealthy in charge. That's what a plutocracy is. A plutonomy is a government just purely up for the rich. And just furious about it. And so this became the new position of the Republican Party. So the Republicans started coalescing is about this. And this is one of the things where you get people who don't really follow politics, and I sympathize with their living, their life, they have, they have jobs, they have family, you know, it's tough. But they'll say things like, you know, why can't the group just come together and work together? Well, yeah, but this shows right here. These are two groups of very intelligent people who are really involved, they're in the system. Madison is Speaker of the House, Jefferson Secretary of State, Hamilton Secretary of the Treasury, and they have fundamental disagreements on the direction of the country. It doesn't mean that they're traitors, even though soon they'll call each other traitors, but it's complex and they'll work together. I mean, today, if they all work together, well, we'd probably get something more, even more like Hamilton. So with that, there'd be a compromise. A dinner is going to be held at the behest of John Adams, the vice president. He technically was not a Federalist, but he's very allied to her. He hated it. He was not alone. Everyone hated him. <laughs> Hamilton was such a jerk. 
Hamilton's going to get caught up in an affair scandal with bribing the person the husband of the woman he has an affair with. And since everyone hated him, and the, the Federalists, they all adopted his policies and abandoned him. Because they all hated him. But back to this. Hamilton, Jefferson, the Vice President, Adams, and Madison all ate for dinner. Had a dinner. This must have been an incredible conversation. And they decided on this. Hamilton knew how to buy off Hamilton and Madison. They wanted a capital outside of the financial centers, the big cities like Philadelphia, New York, or Boston. So they said, well, a rural capital, and I should add one more thing in the South. In the South. I'll give you your capital if you drop your opposition. Did it work? Yes. Here's Jefferson being accused of abandoning his principles for the new capital. Chasing bills above. He's kind of like, I don't know what he's doing, but for some reason that makes me laugh. Okay. By the way, Jefferson's hands were creepy. And thus we have Washington, D.C., or the District of Columbia. Why Washington, D.C.? Well, first off, it makes sense in England after the, pre the first president. I mean, there's a logic to it. But Washington was obsessed with the Potomac River. His plantation was right here. Washington, D.C. is just up the river. They knew he wanted this. He thought the Potomac could be a highway into the interior of the country. Too many rapids and waterfalls. But that's what he thought. So that appeased Washington. So they cut off this area, part of Virginia and Maryland, and made the District District of Columbia. It's a territory of the United States. The part of Virginia, about 20 years later, they decided they didn't need it. So that came back to Virginia. So it's going to be carved out of the Maryland side of the Potomac and it still exists. There was no town there. There was a swamp. So they built it in a swamp. They got the rural capital. And Washington, D.C. would have a very rural Southern feel up until like the New Deal in the 1950s. So with that, oh, and that got Washington support. I should add, so the, the Assumption Bill passed. <laughs> I didn't say it. The Assumption Bill passed. And so last thing, Hank, I'll just quickly get a drink of water. The Wixie Rebellion of 1794. So a rebellion, much like Shades of Rebellion, took place in Western Pennsylvania. Farmers were furious. I don't think in terms of rebellion, like they want to overthrow the, overthrow, overthrow the government, they tarred and feathered a couple of tax collectors and said, we're not going to pay the tax. But this time, Washington has the Constitution. They called the militia out, and Washington would personally lead an army bigger than he ever led in the Revolutionary War to put down the rebellion. He put on his uniform, Alexander Hamilton, put on his uniform, and was his adjutant again. And they marched to Western Pennsylvania, which, yes, they talked about creating the country of Westylvania. I agree, that would have been awesome, but it didn't happen. I don't necessarily, not necessarily, not necessarily, necessarily in, in the country, but the state of Westylvania, wouldn't that have been cool? They want to call this Transylvania, too. I, I'm all for Sylvanians. But the rebellion was put down. It was basically they marched in and they just collapsed. So Shades' rebellion, they couldn't do that. Now, a rebellion of the people against taxes as very unfair taxes to them, but now the United States government can put down rebellion. That's why Hamilton wanted a standing army to put down rebellions. That was the number one mandate of that thing I told you about yesterday, you all know about, called the National Guard, created in 1877, to put down rebellions. So with that, Go, go, get a drink if you want one. The Bank of the United States. The Bank of the United States, Hamilton, this next choice. And this would be the position of the Federalists. The Federalists. Okay, I know you brought the Bank of the U.S., but a couple things we have to make sure we get. This was the implied power. Remember the necessary and proper clause. Nowhere does it say make a bank, but Hamilton said, of course we have to make a bank. Why? Well, first off, we'll create the first corporation. It's not quite the legal entity that's going to come in about 40 years, but it's close. Corporation, a company owned by stockholders, not one person. I will talk to you about the advantage of this a little bit later. So it's going to be owned by shareholders, but they'll have a contract from the United States government. So even though it is technically part of the U.S. government, it is a private, independent company by people who want to make money. And they would collect the tax revenues. A better way to look at it is 
tax revenues would be collected and then funneled to the bank. Then the bank would store the tax revenues. And using this, the ability to tax, they would issue currency and also loan money. The ability to tax. The ability to tax gives value to the money. And they said we would only collect taxes in the currency we issue. That is a bank note from the Bank of the United States. To this day, money is still distributed through the Federal Reserve Bank. And in fact, it, you might think it's federal currency, even though the Bureau of Engraving prints it, that's part of the executive branch. It is federal reserve notes. Anybody have a dollar real quick? I'll try to have a dollar. Give me a dollar. Oh, here's a dollar. So here's a dollar, right? I'll take the 20. <laughs> okay. Right on top, it says, have you ever noticed that? It says Federal Reserve. And that's the bank that that's it's not exactly the same, but it, it's a bank of the United States. It is a central bank. <laughs> Keep up the good work. So they print and they funnel it. And therefore, in bad times, they can pump up the money supply. In good times, where it's going too much, they can kind of pull back on currency to try to slow things down. That's what the Federal Reserve is doing right now. The Federal Reserve is think, thinking that inflation is, is too high, there's too much demand, you know, people are buying stuff. They're raising interest rates, hoping to slow down the economy, aka start a recession, which they are going to do. It's already kind of happening. So then they would take this money, and the big thing is they create banks. They would loan money, and as part of the deal to loan money to this new bank, there are no banks in the United States, no banks at all. They'd loan money as a condition of the loan. They would have to follow the national bank's rules and therefore control the money supply. That's what happens today. Every bank that's reputable. Yeah, there are banks and they're, they usually involve groups like organized crime. They're not reputable. Reputable banks like the normal bank on the street corner, they're all part of the Federal Reserve System. And they have to agree to certain restrictions. But when they borrow money from the Federal Reserve, then they issue currency. That's what happened here. These new banks would take this and then they would loan it out. And that's how they get money out. And then they would loan it to merchants who would have industry. That's the bank. And Jefferson Madison looked at this and they were furious. And I think you might be able to see it right away. Remember the money supply? Remember I talked about inflation and deflation? I went through that and I said how important that was. Just imagine a group of shareholders for personal profit to control the money supply. They could raise it and lower it, creating inflation or deflation for their own personal gain. Remember what deflation does as an example. What does deflation do to the value of money? I know we the value of money goes up. Prices go down. The value of money goes up. Just imagine if you have wealth and you can manipulate the money supply to create deflation, which might cause everyone else to lose wealth. But if you have cash, it goes up with value in value and you've never had to do any. They can manipulate the money supply for personal gain. And therefore, that's what I have right here. The shareholders control the economy, this merchant class. How soon do you suppose it would take the Bank of the United States to start manipulating the money supply for the personal gain of the shareholder? No time at all. Yeah. Actually, a little bit of time, like we're talking days. <laughs> You're exactly right. And we'll see it when the next, the next example of that in the 1830s, they purposely try to destroy the economy to hurt Andrew Jackson. It's coming down the road. Jackson's a character. We'll get to Jackson. And also, it's not one of the enumerated or listed powers. It's not one of the enumerated powers. So they can't do it. Hamilton was furious. That's why I put the Hamilton there. Madison was all for a bank of the United States. Madison wrote the necessary and proper clause. And then Madison turned around and said, you can't do that. It's not enumerated. And Hamilton's like, you wrote it. This was your plan. And Madison's like, eh, okay. 
once Hamilton wanted it, Madison didn't want it. Well, it would go to Washington. Washington agreed, and that's why I put out he went for it. Washington threw his support and it passed. But there was a copy of 20 years. So in 1812, the bank's charter would go for renewal. And the president at that time would be Madison. Even though Madison knew the bank should probably continue, he, he and now the Republicans, because the Federalist Party had basically died, didn't renew the bank. And the money supply dissolved just as we went to war. Madison, four years later, which signed a new bank. So with that, a protective tariff. Reported manufacturers wanted a high tariff. Why? High tariff will increase the price of imports. Prices will go up on imports, and that would encourage local industry. There's no local industry. So you encourage that for domestic production. And Washington was not opposed, or Washington was opposed to this. So a high tariff did not pass. A low tariff, it's called a revenue tariff, would pass. Just a tiny little tax on imports to raise revenues for the federal government. And so the argument of, about the about a tariff would go on for still going on, whether or not a tariff or not a tariff, because that raises all prices, tariffs. And as you put shipping, and, and this plate from um, from Boston in the 1890s just kind of makes me laugh. The success to tariff. Yeah, you really want a tariff if you're getting a plate for that. Buying porcelain became a big deal. That became like the thing. You've made it when you could buy porcelain. Does he tariff? I meant trade. And porcelain, so much porcelain came from China that it started being called China. That's where that comes from. So that and a war. Oh, I should add, almost forgot. Hamilton wanted this, so this became the Federalist position. So therefore, the Republican position was anti tariff Good on that. Next, war. When the French Revolution started in 1789, partially because of the French debt from the Revolutionary War, almost immediately all of Europe went to war. Well, almost every country in Europe that had a king attacked France. Hey, France killed their king. They didn't want to spread. I think you know, kings usually prefer to have their head connected. I've read that somewhere, I don't know. The British, to the American point of view, then became the opposition to the revolution, the opposition to liberty, fraternity, and equality. And so Hamilton admired the British, and so the Federalists and Hamilton supported the British. Jefferson saw that it's my revolution. I wrote the Declaration of Independence, so I started this. He kind of ignored the terror part. And that war went up. Well, Citizen Guinea was a French citizen. They got rid of titles of nobility, so everyone is equal, so they called everybody citizen. They said the same thing in the Soviet Union in that short time when they saw the idea that we'll create this people state that didn't last long in the Soviet Union, but they called themselves Hong. Same deal. But he was French, and he tried to encourage the United States to join and immediately was deported as a dangerous alien to promote revolution. And so he became like a boogeyman for the Federalists. How? By saying that the French are gonna come in through the Republican Party, the Republicans support them and start a revolution. Thus, a dangerous alien. That meant that he was from outer space. The term alien or somebody you're thinking about somebody on a UFO or whatever, that would not be used to after the big UFO scare of 1947. I can so vividly remember the UFO scare of 47. Changed my life. I was in my 50s. So that, here's the big thing. There's going to be a commercial war. So a war, you can imagine both Britain and France are going to try to destroy each other's economy. And so with that, commercial war. And so US merchants are going to be hurt. Who, what party represents the merchants? The Federalists. And Washington, though, would declare neutrality. Washington 
Didn't want to help either one, especially because what could the U.S. do? We didn't have a Navy or an Army. What could we do? Corsairs were French pirates. And so they're stopping American-owned ships. At the same time, the British are blockading French harbors and stopping American-owned ships and kidnapping sailors. That's another story. Somebody might have got to it called impressment. And so the U.S. is involved and they're trying to stay out. So this war is going to rage until eventually the United States will kind of jump in. The War of 1812. But this time there'll be a Republican president, so the U.S. will declare war on Britain. But at this time, the government is relatively pro-British. And they're going to sign a treaty with Britain called Jay's Treaty. Jay, John Jay was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Washington didn't, didn't know who else to send, so he sent the Chief Justice. It seems so weird to send John Roberts today. Of course, the idea of, of Joe Biden leading the army into battle and Jeanette Yellen as Secretary of the Treasury as his adjective also seems incredibly weird today. It's a different world. But the treaty favored Britain in trade. They, they still kept forts in the Great Lakes region. And soon, Federalists are being burnt in effigy and they started calling Washington a traitor. And he wants to bring back the monarchy. George Washington was called traitor. I want you to think about this when we come to politics. And people say, we have never seen such divisive politics as today. That is a problem when people don't know their history. When George Washington was called a traitor, that's divisive politics. And so while this is going on, there's a massive fight in the Northwest. Now, where is the Northwest? The wilds of Ohio. A confederacy of tribes led by the Shawnee and the Miami. You know, they've been devastated by disease, but they're desperately trying to hold out here. And the thing is, those who survived, you know, they, they either had immunities or were developing immunities. And so this was actually, they talked about this in the United States. And they were getting some help from the British. They were going to fight against the expansion of the United States. Little Turker, Turkle, was called Little Turtle normally. The, uh, Miami, Little Turtle is a really impressive guy. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about him. But he understood how to fight the Americans. His main ally was a Shawnee named Blue Jacket. But Blue Jacket was uh, a little bit more hesitant, especially when the British started withdrawing support. But there's going to be a battle that we just simply call St. Clair's defeat. General St. Clair was a Revolutionary War hero, by then pretty much out of touch, led a militia army into the wilds of what is now Ohio, along the Wabash River and were destroyed. Possibly the worst defeat in American military history. St. Clair's defeat. It was so bad that Washington hid the word, music, the, the word from the public and actually lied to Congress about it. Noticeably lied to them. But in the process, that got Hamilton and Washington to create an army. And that's where the U.S. Army comes from, 1794, a standing army. And they begin to train and organize. It's still incredibly small under a guy named Mad Anthony Wayne. And they would come back. And with Blue Jacket hesitant, and they defeated most of the Little Turtles force at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. The British abandoned them. There's a bunch of stuff went on. But that battle, maybe there are two battles that are the most decisive battles the United States are going to conquer and take this land. Yes. And one's in Ohio and the other's in Indiana. The other battle is called Tippy Canoe. But at the Treaty of Greenville after this, the tribes had to give up almost everything of Eastern and Southern Ohio. The rest of this land would remain in the hands of the tribes. How long did the treaty say? Anybody want to guess? How long did forever last? Yeah. While the treaty was being ratified, U.S. settlers were already coming in and soon they'll take that. That'll lead to another war. But when Washington left office in 1796, he's going to give a farewell address. Okay, he didn't read it. He wrote it. 
this is a, a rough draft. The yeah, scribe would write it. They would print out handbills. But he said, avoid foreign entanglements. Seeing what's happening in that war, if the U.S. gets involved in the foreign, foreign wars, that could break apart the republic. The other thing he said was, avoid the partisan divide, a.k.a. parties. These new parties were becoming so divisive. Washington saw this dreamlike attitude that these different groups could come together. It doesn't mean you're bad if you disagree with somebody about the direction of the country, but it was becoming quite volatile as Washington's now being called a traitor and Federalists were calling Republicans traitors wanting to bring the French Revolution in the guillotine. So here's a very creepy picture. It's one of my favorites of Washington talking from the heavens, but he's being ignored as the two parties are pulling the federal edifice apart. And this is supposed to be clouds. Doesn't it look like Washington has been entrapped behind a stone, like in a stone castle? So they imprisoned Washington, and all they could do was watch the country fall apart. So this is the contested election. I know the buzz by ring, ring by, I'll finish this. The contested election of 1796. And here we have two old friends, the two of the authors of the Declaration of Independence, Adams, the Federalist, even though he really technically wasn't a Federalist, the Federalist chose him. Washington's no part of Adams, we call a Federalist. There's going to be one other president who has no party, who's kicked out of vote. His name's John Tyler. Boy, well, we'll get to that guy. Jefferson, the vice president. And remember, each elector has two votes. And this was a bitter election. Here's Republicans saying, the Federalists are going to bring tyranny and save their country from ruin. Here's a Federalist cartoon showing Washington, like following Washington for the greatness of the country. And here's Jefferson trying to hold them back. When the votes came, Adams won. The problem was they didn't figure out yet what to do about the vice president. So the second most votes went to Jefferson. So the leader of the opposition to the president was the vice president. That would be very similar if today Joe Biden was president and Donald Trump was vice president. You might have what, what's the word I'm looking for? Mixed words, mixed messages, so to speak. So what happened almost immediately? War. That bribery scandal. The XYZ, you don't need um, the French. French diplomats, nickname X, Y, and Z, demanded a bribe. It's a seat for Minister Tally McGrann, but you don't need to know that. The U.S. said, we'll never pay a bribe. They want to stop the Corsairs. But I want to show you two pictures really quick. Here is Lady Columbia, who represents the United States. I've talked about her before. You notice the feathers, though? What did American Indians still represent? Yeah, liberty is the word they would have used, but yeah. We go see Tally Rand. Let me show you one more picture. Here's the XYZ affair. It's going to be a war. Here's the mini headed monster of the French government. But look at this real fast. Here's French liberty. And look how they draw her. And what is she dealing with? What's that? That's when the terror is going on. So we'll go through a lot tomorrow again. Uh, the quiz goes, I think they can last one. It might be 10 minutes. You got three minutes. You're welcome for three minutes. <laughs> oh, bribes, everybody. The cauldron's here. <laughs> Thank you. We'll bring it to next week. Thank Have a good day, everybody. Clean that up. What are you thinking? No, that's not good enough. Take it down to the bathroom and clean it up. What the heck were you thinking? Go! But I filmed that, me yelling at somebody.